Hello there, everybody, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly uh, virtual roundtable where we discuss all manner of uh, Beatles discussion, uh, whether it's uh, their history, what's going on today, or uh, what may be happening in the future. Uh, I'm Al Sussman from Beatle Fan Magazine, and I'm here with my uh, my three co-hosts. Uh, first of all, the the host of the syndicated Beatles uh, radio show, Every Little Thing, Ken Michaels. Hi, Ken. Hey, Al. How's everyone doing? Great, Ken. And uh, then the as uh, as Alan Cozen called him a week or so ago, the uh, the world's uh, the world's only remaining uh, full time uh, Beatles journalist. Oh my God! And, uh, that Spain is here. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he does work for uh, for Billboard and for uh, Axes A X S dot com. You know, for those of you worrying about possibly uh, any you know World War Two uh, memorial <laughs> websites. Uh, oh God! <laughs> <laughs> and that's uh, Steve Marinucci. Hey, Steve. Hello, Al. God, I feel like I feel like a uh, species that's uh, dying or something. I don't something know. like that. Yeah, really. <laughs> and um, and species. then our, and then our uh, our resident musicologist, a uh, longtime music critic for the the New York Times, and has uh, been doing work as well re- more recently for the Wall Street Journal and various other publications, and has also been a contributor to Beatle Fan Magazine since uh, virtually the beginning. And that's Alan Cozen. Hey, Alan. Hey Al, hello everyone. And we have a uh, a guest tonight, another another frequent contributor to the show, another f- longtime contributor to uh, to Beatle Fan Magazine, as well as to Joe Johnson's Beatle Brunch, to the the Fest for Beatles fans, and various and sundry other things. And that's uh, Tom Frangione. Hey, hey gentlemen, Tom. good good to be back here. Yeah, hello, welcome Tom. back. Been a bit, it's been a little while. I think last time we talked was probably part one of what we're going to talk about tonight. <laughs> yeah. I was I was trying to remember. Yeah, I wasn't sure whether whether we had gotten your uh, your thoughts on the the original film, and we'll be getting to that in a few moments because our uh, our subject matter will be uh, indeed the DVD release, which came out uh, just this past weekend as we're uh, as we're taping of eight days a week, the touring year. Uh, it's uh, in its uh, deluxe form. Uh, it's two discs, either on Blu-ray or DVD. Uh, there's also a single disc uh, version, which just has the just has the film, just eight days a week, not eight days a week, and the Shea Stadium cut, just eight days a week. So anyway. Uh, that was our uh, the, sort of the inspiration for inviting Tom on tonight because I know he's working on a piece for uh, for Beetle fan, as a matter of fact, about the DVD. So I thought we could sort of uh, hash things out. We've been gaining new listeners, so um, so I think probably before we get into the the special features on the DVD, we probably should do just give a little brief summation of our thoughts on on the film itself having seen the film in theaters and then subsequently on hulu uh back in uh back in september and we probably should start with alan because he did a an extensive piece on eight days a week and also the beatles live at the hollywood bowl which ran first in the wall street journal and uh an expanded version of that is in oddly enough the current issue of beetle fan magazine so briefly alan what were your thoughts about the film well briefly i guess uh you know i i, I had sort of uh a, a fairly schizophrenic feeling about it i mean simply as a listener who likes watching the Beatles and chat about the Beatles. I kind of enjoyed it. I thought it was a, you know, a a reasonably good way to spend an hour and a half. Um, As someone who is a more sort of detailed oriented historian type, I had lots and lots of problems with it. Um, 
and, and lots of problems with it being called a documentary, given mm -hmm. some of the, um, shall we say, fakery that went on. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so the, that was my feeling. My feelings are complicated. It's not either pro or con. I, I, I still find it an enjoyable thing. When the Blu-ray came out, I popped it in really just um, – because actually I was setting up an, a, a, a different TV and just wanted to see that the connections were okay. And once it came on, I couldn't stop watching it. So, so there is that. Now, what were your feelings then about the, uh, about the Blu-ray itself? Not, not the, we'll get to the special features, but uh, how about the film itself um, as, a, as, a, um, as, a, as a video experience as opposed to in the theater? I don't know. I mean, it, you know, I also had watched it on uh, Hulu when it, mm -hmm. you know, so I saw it in the theater. I saw it a couple of times on Hulu, and I watched the D the Blu-ray. Uh, I, I I don't know. I, I can't say that the experience was really any different. Uh, I think in a certain way, it actually looks a bit better on a smaller screen than the theater because, uh, you know, a lot of it was, was so big that, that the flaws in the films were much more apparent. Um, not that some of them aren't apparent on your TV screen either, um, mm. but I think in a, a smaller image actually, to me, looked a bit tighter, you know. But, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was pretty much what I expected it to be, a Blu-ray of the film, you know. It, I, didn't, um, I didn't notice anything unusually good or bad about it. Now, Ken, I think you had um, you had seen it in the theater, and you did not see any of the Hulu. Viewers. No, I, I've seen it twice. I saw oh, it in the okay. theater first, and then we had a special presentation at the college where I do my Beatles show. Okay. With a Q and A with Jeff Jones, so right. I saw it two times on the big screen, and I just got the DVD, so I'll be watching it more. But I'm not as super critical as. Most of us, you know, I'm looking at this as being something that would appeal to mainly a mainstream audience, hopefully uh, a younger audience that doesn't know every single detail about the Beatles history. If you know the whole order of what happened live with the Beatles, you're going to you're going to pick out all the things that weren't in this film. And then there was quite a lot. And when we discussed this film, when it first came out, there are a lot of things that we brought up here that were not in the film that I thought was essential to telling the, the story of the Beatles as a live group, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, in particular, the Hamburg years, there wasn't that much said about it. I think even, Al, you mentioned that while you had um, the London Palladium show, you didn't have the Royal Variety show, mm -hmm. you know, little things like that, which, you know, if you're a historian, you've really studied this thing and you know the whole history, you know, very key moments in the Beatles history and a lot of it was left out. Mm. But as far as telling the whole story about the Beatles as a live group and focusing more on America, which I think a lot of people look at as being a major criticism, not spending mm -hmm. enough time in the rest of the world, mm -hmm. uh, I think it told the story really well. It's not just them as a live band. It's all the problems that incurred being the biggest band in the world, uh, you know, living pretty much, you know, claustrophobic <laughs> during those years and being in each other's pockets and how they somehow managed to not only perform well early on, but to do everything else. The recordings they did, the movies that they made, the press conferences that they did, all in a very short period of time. I think as a narrative, it really captured that pretty well. So, um, you know, I think this film serves a purpose. There, there are times when I felt like, you know, especially when it comes to George Harrison, it seems like so many of the interview clips that are used are from the Beatles anthology. <laughs> you know, it kind of gives me an anthology light kind of feel. Um, well, uh, unfortunately, that's unavoidable because, um, you know, unfortunately, he hasn't been available for the last 15 years. <laughs> no, but I mean, drawing on all the interviews that he did, he didn't give as much as John and Paul as far as interviews, but usually his interviews carried a lot of weight. So, mm. You know, they're usually very strong, but how much is there on the subject that George talked about? I mean, yeah. That much that's the problem that's true. yeah but uh you know it has its problems but overall you know i'm very concerned, concerned about as we talked about in our last show appealing to a young audience and if this could lead to young people wanting to 
um, educate themselves more about the Beatles and their music and their history, then I think it did a very good job in doing so. Mm -hmm. And Steve, how about you? Well, I've seen it quite a few times. Um, right. Between, I saw it on the big screen. I saw it, and I I watched it. Oh, I don't know, four or five times, including once today, on Hulu. And I've seen, and I've also watched it on uh, the Blu-ray. And um, initially, after I saw it in the theater, I was, you know, I was fairly positive about it I, I i you know i said i think i when we talked about it earlier i i said i liked it and i still like it but in the process of the last couple of days i pulled out the anthology there was one thing specifically about the anthology that they did there that they did not do here and that's the fact that all the observations in the in the anthology were from the beatles from Derek Taylor, from Neil Aspinall. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the case in this film, and I really think that hurt. Um, mm -hmm. I think that that really took away from the strength of the film. That one one of the things about the anthology is that you know the observations are from people who were there, and you get people in in um, in here, for example, Howard Goodall. Elvis Costello, who who was a musician, I I grant you, but wasn't really there. Sigourney Weaver, who kind of was there. Whoopi wow. Gold, who kind of was there. <laughs> was there for a half uh, hour. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> right. But I mean, you got you got observations. Uh, Paul Greengrass, Stephen Stark. You got observations from a bunch of people that are put in there basically as talking heads, and it really, I don't think it helped. The, the film at all. I will say the stories, some of the stories are interesting. I liked Whoopi Goldberg's story about take, about being taken to Shea Stadium. I thought that was very cool. I thought the one about and I'm looking for a name on my sheet here and I don't have it. The one, the um, the woman who talked about uh, um, uh, the uh, Jacksonville concert. Right. I, I thought that was one of the best parts of the film. Mm -hmm. I thought that was that was a, a very strong part of the film. But the, the the thing in watching the film is that even though they called it a documentary, I don't know how you can call it a documentary because it's not really a documentary. It's more of a it's more of a light, and I don't and I'm not saying I know people have called it anthology light, but it's more of a lightweight film. It it really it's 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 too happy. It's too happy. It's not serious, not mm -hmm. as serious as it should have been. I will say that. I'm glad that the one person giving observations that I was very glad to see in there was Peter Asher, who was there. Mm. It right. Was to see, it was great to see Peter in there. And yeah. it would have been – but again, I think this would have been a much stronger film had the focus been on the people who were there yeah. and with the observations of the people who were there. Mm -hmm. And that really where is what I think – where the film falls off, and I suspect that it was because they, you know, gave themselves a deadline, and they and they could only do so much. And this way, you know, with all the interviews, they were able to get this done. I I, I suspect, but it's just uh, watching the. If you pull out the anthology and watch it, you know, there's just no comparison. It's just it's just, you know, I don't I, I don't want to use the words as a shame, but it really doesn't measure up. It, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't hold a candle to the anthology. The anthology is everything that this should have been. Well, of course, they're two very different things, especially uh, especially in terms of time, you know, elapsed time. Well, I, I and, yeah, and also and also the the intent. But uh, that, but true. but they could have if they if they had made this a little more serious, they went for a lighter tone, and I really think that hurt. I really mm -hmm. think it would have had more power on the screen and and at home. As a documentary, yep. if they had done that, yeah, they were zeroing in on one topic here, on the Beatles' history, and that's their performances and their touring years. I that's agree. What we're focusing on. It I wasn't agree, looking at every angle. I agree, but if you look at the again, if you look at the anthology, and I this morning pulled out, happened to pull out the Shea Stadium part, which of course had all the remastered Shea, uh, Shea stuff that we saw. You know, in here and also, you know, after the the film, but it also had 
a lot more. Uh, there was a lot more. I, I just all around, there was just so much more to it, you know. And uh, even and and the period after, I mean, the, the focus of the anthology was much stronger than this was. The Beatles so, anthology I mean, I, was their full story. This is one part of their story. Atheist. Right, but again, you're telling you're telling a story to a lot of people who haven't heard it, who may not have seen the anthology. And if you're going to tell a serious story, the focus should be on the people who's, who are the subject of the story, not all these other talking heads. And that's really kind of what happens here. And that that's where I think the film falls off. That's not to say it's not something I won't watch ever again, because there are, you know, it, it's, it, it is enjoyable. And there are moments like the, the, uh, the Jacksonville story that are... I mean that that is very significant, and that made a big impression on everybody who saw it. But um, I just think that the film could have been a lot stronger. And how um, how do you now? You obviously saw the Hulu uh, um, screenings yeah. of it. Yeah, um, I, that's how the, same, you, the, the, the same as the D, as the first DVD. Right. Yeah. There's no di- there's no difference there. Right. Exactly. Go ahead. Exactly. Okay. Now, we, Tom, we, okay, you're going to no, ask. We're no, gonna no, ask no, that was basically you. Uh, you answered my question. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, I've seen. I've watched both. I mean, I've watched the Hulu and the and the Blue Media skin, and they're both right. The, the, yeah. The, it's the same. Okay. And you, uh, did you have any particular vibe about how how the film <clears throat> is as a home video, as opposed um, to seeing it on the on the big screen? I didn't think it gained anything at home. Okay. Uh, I mean, it gained. A, I, 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 when I wrote my review on Access the other day, I, I said it didn't gain anything. I mean, it's basically what it is. I don't. Yeah, I don't really see that it gained a whole lot. I mean, it's going to be it's G-rated entertainment pretty much. I mean, I think there there's a couple of cuss words in it. I think, but it's basically. I mean, it's basically a family movie, which it which it was yeah. to begin with. Right. Tom, I think you've been sort of wrestling with all of this. <laughs> uh, just seeing it in black and white this morning, I can tell that you've uh, you're conflicted about certain aspects of the film. Yeah, the the film. Uh, you know, I saw it in the movies uh, a couple times, and you know, to kick back and watch the Beatles on a forty foot screen is not going to be a bad night for me, no matter what they do with it. But looking at it, you know, with a with a critical eye. You know, Alan used a good word before, fakery, um, you know, in that this was, um, you know, packaged or at least pitched as a documentary of the touring years. You know, I I didn't get as upset uh, as some people did with things that they tinkered with, like colorizing a press conference or something, you know. I've mm-hmm. often told, I told people since seeing it that night, the first night, I've seen that press conference so many times, I... I actually thought it happened in black and white. Right. Uh, <laughs> it's just how I'm used to, to, to imagining it. That stuff doesn't bother me because, you know, look, the event happened in color. Now, you know, I, all right, if it's a shade too dark of blue or peach or whatever, look, it's an imperfect science. As a Beatles fan and as a Beatles, whatever we are, historians, journalists, uh-huh. artists, whatever, what really upset me was, you know, I see this stunning, absolutely stunning footage. Um, the Manchester show never looked so good. I mean, it looked like a million bucks up there, and there's the date, and the Manchester theater, and the whole bit, and what's playing underneath but the Hollywood Bowl track. What's going to happen is this 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 is going to become an archive piece, and a documentary piece, and people are going to go back and are going to say, oh, and, and here's the Beatles at Manchester. This is what this is, the recording from Manchester. And this is how you know, gee, you know, all of us have collected uh, the Dutch imports over the years. And I always wondered how things could be so materially, you know, mislabeled, misidentified. Was it slipshod? Was it intentional? Who knows? This is how this kind of stuff gets a pretty solid foothold, right? You're going to an, a, you know, a supposedly authoritative work by a extremely respected director, and you know you. The, the, the guy on the street who plunks down 20 or 25 bucks for this thing has a right to believe when he's watching this that that is the Manchester performance. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that kind of stuff, kind of, that, that really was the part that bothered me most. 
even you know when we saw the the Shea Stadium footage the, as part of the double feature, yeah, you know the, it's rare that there's ever a concert film that doesn't have some sweetening or some you know doubling up of a bass track or something like that. But sure. here, it really, really we rework, reworked the audio, put uh, studio tracks underneath in a couple of places. Yeah, right. You know, which really kind of bothered me, especially um, if anyone out there has seen the the version of Shea that was prepared for the anthology in 91 or 92, um, you know, the sound was, was beefed up. And let's face it, going back to January 66, they went and beefed up that sound then, okay, Absolutely. because of the technology limitations that they had. But at least it was the, the representation of, of what happened that night. Probably the most sincere part of the film when it came to stuff like that was when they, they showed the little... Uh, tin horn that the sound was probably coming through in Shea uh, and turned the sound down and said this is probably what it sounded like back then coming through the baseball yeah. you, know, you know actually though if, if you look at it again if you look at Shea again they showed their little tin horn but if you would look at the pictures of the Beatles you see that all through the stage there are large speakers set up facing the audience. So they actually did have a different sound system than they're claiming, and it's right there on the video. Yeah, well, my, my understanding is what they used for that show was for the uh, you know, musicians and, and club folk out there was the old Shure, S-H-U-R-E, Vocal Master, 100 mm -hmm. watt PA. Mm -hmm. We used mm -hmm. to use that in a little pub called Libanati's in Bergenfield, mm -hmm. uh, three acoustic <laughs> guitars. Uh, I'm pretty sure that it was no match for the 55,000. Oh, definitely uh, not. But it also oh. wasn't just the, the PA, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, all, um, so, all of us now have stereo systems that are way more than 100 watts, you know, of right? Of In little rooms. Mm -hmm. That was my main gripe with the film. What I did like about it, um, it's, you know, the pace of it is good. Yeah, you know, I would have loved to have seen a lot more complete songs obviously that would have eaten up a lot more real estate on the clock what i thought howard did really really well and i thought to great effect was the new footage um that was discovered for candlestick park by the time they got there i was almost tired of watching them i was tired because they looked tired um mm -hmm. it, with a lot of the photos and films that you saw from 66 and the candlestick stuff had this grainy and dark it was almost like a sense of you were going to a funeral. You knew this was the end of of this phase of their careers. Um, what he did really, really well, because you couldn't end it there. Okay, you, There's no way you could just end the movie on that note. People would be jumping off ledges somewhere. Right. Um, you know, In you know, probably under a minute, he says, you know, then they went in the studio and made these great masterworks, Sergeant Pepper, Magical Mystery Tour, Abbey Road, and then they came back to do it one more time. Now, again... Even more so than the um, than the press conference we talked about before, which we've seen a thousand times. How many times have we seen the rooftop concert? The the linking from August '66 to January '69, about a two and a half year period, with just that thirty seconds of space or sixty seconds of space in between. When they came back, I thought I thought the Beatles looked like they were a hundred years old when they were up on the roof. They, mm -hmm. the, the, the stark contrast in their faces and yep. their hair and everything else, because you had just seen them a minute ago, not, you know, not for nothing, 66, there's still no mustaches or anything. It's still the, you know, right. the, the bangs and the, you know, and the, uh, the old uh, bowl haircuts, um, mm -hmm. I even if the hair was a little bit longer. Boy, by the time they got up to the roof, I mean, John looked like he aged 100 years. Um, and you know, then you know, the, you know, Paul with the big bushy beard and and all that stuff. I said, "Wow! I mean, look at how this took a toll on them." I never really, you know, looked at it that directly before, but I thought uh, I thought that was real effective filmmaking. So overall, I mean, I liked it for what it was. I am th there's no other word uh, to use except maybe upset or disappointed um, with the 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 real liberal use of swapping out audio tracks and mixing and matching them with the videos um that's going to be a thorn in, in sides for a while i mean we're we're kind of analyzing this now i mean that's what this show is about five years from now somebody that never that didn't see it the first time is going to pick it up and go hey look great you know that, boy that, that manchester stuff looked great and sounded great and you know it's it's going to to kind of fade and blend into history 
Um, and, and that kind of bothers me. To that end, um, you know, about a year ago, we did a show here. One of the times you guys were good enough to invite me on um, talking about the, the one plus package, the deluxe, you know, video. <laughs> yep. I mean, what I loved about that as, you know, just as a fan was I could go to that DVD and and extract out all different versions, whether they were different mixes, whether they were live versions, whether they were those TV sync-up versions like on Hey Jude and, St- and Revolution and things like that. I'd say, wow, we can make ourselves a nice little side collection of like alternate listening, even if you didn't have the you know the the, the video going, just you know something to play in the car or whatever. Um, here, there's not a lot of not a lot of salvage uh, value in that regard. Uh, I think in the movie we only get one complete, you know, take one without any voice song. Song. Yeah, yeah, without voiceovers right. and without yeah. edit or anything else. Mm-hmm. That's the, um, the version of I saw her standing there from Candlestick. So I'm sorry, from uh, Washington D.C. Right. So you know, what, I remember writing in a very brief, um, you know, here are my thoughts on the movie uh, blast that I sent out. I said. You know what? When they when they do the DVD, this will be a great opportunity for them to say, okay, you know, we played however many samples of songs in the movie, a dozen, uh-huh. twenty, or whatever it was. Here are the alternate. You know, here here are the uncut takes. I said mm. that that'll be kind of special. Uh, mm-hmm. Without uh, stealing anyone's turn, because I guess now we'll start talking about what else is in the package, like the bonus uh, footage. That proved to be a you know wishful thinking on my part. Yeah, um, you can see and, that. You know, and uh, you know it's it it, it uh, as as Steve wrote in, in his post today. You know, it's there there, there is some good in that um, in that uh, bonus disc, but at the end of the day, I think we've come full circle with no matter what folks thought of the movie. Um, and I think we've had you know a few valid you know and and clean opinions tonight. The, the overriding sense I get from a lot of our readership and people I've talked to at the fest and things like that is, yeah, it's good, but you know what? It's not the movie I'd have made, okay? I would yeah. love, you know, a nice, complete, uh, and, and even Steve before was saying, you know, boy, it only really took one corner, uh, you know, the touring years. And, uh, you know, to your point, Al, about, well, you know, and it didn't have, like, the whatever, the Royal Variety show. Well, you know, without splitting hairs, you know, Royal Variety is not part of a tour. It was, you know, a four-song set or whatever they did. If if this was strictly and and you know and some sort of ironclad rule that it was about the tours, um, well then you know there's there's stuff that fits in there and stuff that doesn't. Um, well, the tour, the tour years. They went beyond the tour years, yeah. But and they went beyond the tour years. Certainly, they went to they went to, they went to 1969 and showed them up on the roof. They right. sure weren't touring then. Um, yeah. And they and actually they took a you know they went to the rearview mirror. Um, and went back as far as 62 and showed, you know, the piece from the cavern. And certainly those weren't tours. I mean, by definition, right. weren't touring. They were still home. They were still in Liverpool. They weren't on any tour. Right. Um, so, you know, so that, you know, it stretches the, you know, the parameters a little bit. And that's okay. You know, as, as a movie to watch, I, I think, you know, my, my overall assessment at the time and probably still is, you know, I'd give it an 8 on a 10-point scale. I will say this, even as a, you know, long-time collector of a lot of the um, of the footage and the audio tracks and stuff, there was there was still enough in there that I looked up and said, "Wow, I've never seen this." Mm-hmm. Uh, and from wherever it came from, you know what? Uh, that that made it worth it for you know folks like us and and people who are a little bit more passionate about it or who may have been you know more enthusiastic about collecting things and making sure they've seen you know, all the outtakes and whatnot. But um, so th- there was plenty there to to keep that going. As I said, things like colorization, which seemed to be a uh, a major bone of contention for some people. Look, as long as they're not colorizing a hard day's night or a work of art, or, you, right. know, yeah, you know, where you know, you know, the director wanted certain lighting and you know, it was filmed in black and white for a reason. Um, you know, look, things like interviews and press conferences, and for that matter, live performance. Well, they happened in color. That's artistic. Well, so, well, hard day's night happened in color. I mean. Well, no, but the, the the piece of film, you know, what they were shooting, you know, was was made with the intent that it would be seen in black and white. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, but yeah, 
But it might have been just because they didn't want to spend money on color. I mean, I, I, I just don't buy that. The, uh, for me, I mean, the colorization really is an issue. And a press conference, okay, I don't care that much. But they colorized the performance clips, too, in a lot of cases. And in, in some of the cases, they colorized them pretty badly. I mean, I know some of you guys yeah. think they're okay. Uh, I I looked at them which again. Ones, which ones don't you let you don't? Like um, the can't buy me love um, yes. from the NME. That looks yeah, just, just awful. awful. And uh, and and the Washington Coliseum. It's just you know. Look, Ron Howard. When we we interviewed Nigel Sinclair and uh, Paul Crowder shortly after the film came out, and they said that well, Ron Howard's rule was that if it if if you could have had a color camera in there and it could have been filmed in color, we were accepting that. And that, to me, I mean, Opie, I love you, but that is the silliest <laughs> rationalization I have ever yeah. heard. I mean, <laughs> that is just ridiculous. It wasn't filmed in color. It was filmed in black and white. And yeah. and and if it if this is simply supporting the view that young kids won't watch stuff in black and white. I'm sorry. They should be put into a room, strapped into a seat, and made to watch <laughs> lots and lots of black and white. Because, you know what? It's fine. It was filmed in black and white. It looks okay in black and white. In some cases, it looks better in black and white, like oh. the NME concert. And, yeah. and you know, they should have just left it. So now I'm sort of afraid that, like, if, you know, Steve and I were talking earlier about what they could have had as bonuses and... You know, I mean, I think that there were a lot of issues with the Shea concert, that some of which Tom mentioned. Um, and so I wouldn't have liked them to include the Shea concert because I really think that they should rethink the Shea concert before they put it out. But now I'm afraid if I was thinking maybe they should have put the Washington Coliseum out, but what if they would have colorized the whole thing? Yeah, it, would have really? been, it just would have been awful. I mean, See, I'm not a, I, I didn't have a whole lot of problems with the Washington. I thought it looked pretty good, actually. Mm. What did you have? You guys seen the colorized footage from a Hard Day's Night that's been floating around? Yeah, so, no. there's about two minutes of uh, colorized. I, I, it's it's obviously it, was done by somebody, but right, it's not um, official. But, but uh, yeah, it's not official. But it, it, that looks pretty interesting. I've I think I posted it on my Facebook page one day, and I got all sorts of reactions. It was like mm. wow. Yeah, so, uh, I'll st I'll stick with black and white. No, I I agree. I agree. I'm just saying, you know, you were talking about things that didn't that shouldn't have been in in color, but I mean, there is some of that floating around. And... Yep. Uh, as a matter of fact, before we get into the into the special features, <laughs> let me just put in uh, my two cents worth. Uh, I'm just I'm gonna just take issue with you just very slightly about the the pace of the film in watching it on, you know, on DVD, I just felt that it's just, everything is just so, it's just so fast. Everything is, it's just accelerate. In fact, see if maybe I'm, I, I'm hallucinating about this, but the, on that, that VHS quality clip from the February 9th, 64 Ed Sullivan show. Is it my imagination or was the performance of all my loving speeded up a little bit? It's absolutely speeded up. Okay. Um, and you know, for that matter, the, the one, the version of SARS standing there from DC is, is, you know, really sped up. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think, I think, uh, in certain cases, like when they were mixing and matching, like the Hollywood Bowl footage, let's say to Manchester, you know, there is going to be some speed adjustment necessary just, just for syncing it up. Mm. But when you're using, let's say for all my love and from the soul, yeah, the same thing, it's the same performance. performance. <laughs> it's a, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They, they did, uh, they did speed up and, uh, alter some of the, some of the pitch. And that footage, by the way, you, I think, you know, I know I wasn't the only one who pointed it out. Watching that in the theaters on the big screen, it didn't look so sharp. Oh, uh, terrible. You know, it looks better for sure on the, on the home video. On the A DVD. little. Yeah, it definitely looks better there. And it's certainly when they show parts of it in the bonus footage, it looks a damn sight better. So I think, I don't right. know if, they, if Apple, you know, had, you know, had use of it for different purposes in 
bonus footage versus feature film footage. I, I don't know any of the, uh, yeah. the licensing uh, parameters, uh -huh. but the pieces that are used on the bonus foot footage look absolutely better than the parts in the feature footage. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. So that was kind of, that. That was a little bit weird. Other than that, the the movie. Uh, I mean, it translated well to uh, to DVD. I had had a DVD, a uh, like a reviewer copy, which I had seen it, you know, uh, at home once or twice and shared mm -hmm. it to a couple people. So didn't look uh, any better, or any worse than that. So uh, you know, it's pretty much what we're getting. I'm happy that they they drew the line nicely and said feature footage, you know, feature film on one, bonus footage on the other. Um, kind of like how they how they do that without having you know some bonus footage on with the feature and it just gets a little messy. They they did do it at least uh, pretty tidily. So also, My, I'm sure I'm sure they uh, know that when uh -huh. you're doing a documentary, there's a certain amount of time that is the maximum in their minds. You know yeah. because especially if you're dealing with a younger audience, <laughs> probably they don't have that long an attention span. So uh -huh. if this was going to be two hours long. You probably would have lost people after that hour and a half. Yeah. Probably were thinking an hour and a half was probably as far as you can go. Sadly. But that's that's their thinking. I, yeah. I just feel that just the, 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 the speed of it, the pace of it was just too frenetic. They just and 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 again they did, you know, they did uh, totally ignore uh some major some major moments, but also for instance when you mentioned Tom, you mentioned Candlestick Park, and there was uh, okay. You know they do have that you know that home movie footage that was uh, that was discovered, but there's there was virtually none of the Jim Marshall photos from the from the concert, and uh, and also there was none of the the Tony. You know it's not the greatest quality in the world, but it's a kind of a historical document. Any of Tony Barrow's sure. set recording of the concert yeah. itself. I mean that yeah. is the last Beatles concert before yeah. a paying audience. Yeah, they and they, and yeah. it seemed to be um, you know it seemed to fly by a little too quickly. By the way, get, getting getting back to Sigourney Weaver, I've heard, although Tom, and Tom, maybe you know, that she was not at Hollywood Bowl after all. Oh no! Well, that that uh, that footage, she was at the concert, uh -huh. but that 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 footage of her that was taken, uh, I think, the day before, at some kind of fan club uh, gathering. Oh, okay. So it wasn't actually from the concert itself. Okay. Yeah, she was there. I, okay. You know. Yeah, I think but, it was that garden party that Groucho Marx yes, went to, that and, was, and the, yes. the fans were all outside, so she was outside with the fans. Oh, really? A, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can I just say one quick thing? Please. To bounce off something that Tom said about when you're getting to 66 and you're realizing that the end is near as far as the live performances are concerned. One thing I think they did very effectively was when they brought up the Budokan shows and you had the Beatles doing Nowhere Man and they focused in on Ringo yeah. and the look on mm -hmm. his face and he's looking right. really down like we're sounding like crap here. <laughs> you know? yeah. He had food poisoning that day. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, he did. That's you know. true. That is true. Okay. Yeah, that's why that's I, what I said. <laughs> <laughs> that's why uh, you know. Look, neither one of those performances captures them at their best, and they're obviously doing songs that have more complicated harmony, more complicated guitar. Right. But the of the two, the white suits. Uh, the following day, you know, if I have to flip a coin, I go to the white suits. Yeah, because Ringo looks utterly miserable there, and uh, you know, if you've ever had a bout of food poisoning, you can you can sympathize. Mm -hmm. so. Well, they Absolutely. certainly made it look like. <laughs> oh, look no, yeah. face. Well, but especially my guess is they use that one for that reason. Is that yeah. they used that show to show? I mean, the, the overriding sense was they weren't having fun anymore, right? right. That was that was the punchline here? And uh, especially since there had been footage earlier in the film of Ringo at you know the Washington Coliseum, the Hollywood Bowl, oh, having yeah. a great time. Oh yeah, no, absolutely yeah. at the top of his game, and yeah. here he looked absolutely, absolutely miserable. So mm -hmm. at least symbolically, it did nope. it did show just how sure. 
you know, just how miserable all of this had, had really become. Mm. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. As I said, my, my problem just is the, the, basically the pacing. I just feel that it was, that it's just a little too fast. Uh, Steve's point about it being maybe too, too light is, is actually not, uh, not a bad one at all. Uh, well, I think, I think they go hand I, in hand. Is, yeah, you know, they, exactly. They had to get all that, you know, talking head footage in. And yeah. I mean, boy, you know, that that is one place on the bonus disc where, you know, to Steve's point, we, seeing a few other people who were there, and certainly yes. Peter Asher added Peter a lot Asher. Of mm-hmm. muscle in that department. But even when they did the Liverpool stuff, you know, even if it was Bill Harry, Alan Williams, Frida mm-hmm. Kelly. Frida. Uh, people like that. I mean, all valid connections to the story. Certainly more mm-hmm. valid than you know Eddie Izzard or something. Or yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You know, I mean, at one point, I mean, I don't want to go too deep into the bonus stuff yet till we get there. But right, you know, the 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 talking head footage that's you know on the B reel on the bonus stuff. You know, at one point, Whoopi says something so insightful as to, and the song I remember was "I Want to Hold Your Hand," and they played it on the radio, and I thought that sounds great, terrific. Yeah. Anybody could have said that. Um, you know, it, really, it, it added nothing, nothing to the proceedings. You know, but then when you get, you know, the the Peter Ashers or, or Frida Kelly's or, or, you know, people like that weighing in, it was, it absolutely, um, you know, the, I think the you know, score won for the bonus footage over the main feature in that department for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I in fact now obviously this is a film that was heavily aimed at millennials right. except that I'm not I'm not sure how how much Malcolm Gladwell right. resonates with millennials well I'll, I'll tell you this having having met Malcolm Gladwell you see I dropped names out of anywhere he was a okay a speaker at some conference we went to and mm-hmm. his book outliers was the was his you know then you know, bestseller. Well, right. I guess it was maybe his third book or something like that in that in that series. And again, bridging into the um, into the bonus footage, the very last piece of it is an alternate opening to the film, which contained a brief comment yes. from Malcolm and touched on something that did show up in the film, that ten thousand hour rule. And I'm sitting there, you know, the accountant in me is coming out saying, yeah, Uh yeah, I know. I know there's a (laughs) tenth. Okay. The the concept, you know, okay. At the end of the day, it it makes perfect sense. You know, to become good at something, you have to spend time doing. Right. Okay. I can believe that. (laughs) Um, But, you know, there's, and of course it's not 10,000, meaning, you know, if you do 9,985 hours, you just doesn't cut it. No, it's it's a, it's a concept Um, where it loses frankly uh, uh, uh you know a lot of its validity in this case is you know he he cites they had done 1200 concerts by the time they did their first record okay how many of those were with ringo star probably fewer than 10 percent. and how many of them lasted more than an hour right yeah so we're so, really only up to 1200 hours max so right well then well then and certainly you know, rehearsals tv footage the bbc shows whatever it is but you know, a good chunk, if you think of the, the window of when Ringo joins in August of 62, and when they're literally making their first record as he joins, mm-hmm. right? September, right. you know, they, they come back and do Love Me Do and mm-hmm. P.S. I Love You. You know, he literally gets there as they're making their first record. It's part of the, it, they're one in the same in, in the timeline. And in um, fact, the June 6th session with Pete Best was supposed to be for their first record. Right. Mm-hmm. So you, right. you've got, you, uh, so, you know, studio time is virtually, is, is not virtually, it's nil. In terms of live performance, okay, well, I'm sure the Lewison book is, you know, within a few feet of this, <laughs> of this phone line, but <laughs> he's played now with them from middle of August till they're making their first record the first week of September. Okay. It's, you're talking about a three week period. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, yeah, the ten thousand hour rule kind of flies out the window right there. Unless unless you're gonna so. say Ringo's unless you're saying Ringo's not a real part of the story. Or he was no, practicing with Rory Storm in the Hurricanes. You know. No, um, the, the the part about he, the Ringo that we should always bring up is, you know, he just fit right in from right, all the years is. of of working with Rory Storm and the other bands. But no, those twelve hundred other concerts are, are really important because, you know, you have to include Hamburg in there. Oh, of but course they also play eight, eight hours a night. 
So yeah, that's well, where that's... how they became a really great live band. Right, that. but but a lot, but all that is done largely without Ringo. Right. He's only there for the last trip to Hamburg. Mm-hmm. Okay, but you still got to credit John Paul and George. Oh, of course. All, so it's it's you know what is it twelve you know if, uh, so I guess John Paul and George get the you know get the A on the report card for the ten thousand hour rule and Ringo gets an incomplete. He's like D Day in Animal House. Oh, I'm sorry. not I'm not I'm not sure you can interpret the the rule that way. I mean, no. um, Ringo put in his let's not exactly. really ten thousand hours playing with other groups. I mean, uh, yeah. you know the New York Philharmonic. Those guys didn't play together for for ten thousand hours before they made a record. They played here and there and then they came together and played as an ensemble. But I think what he means. Is is individually you have to put in the time to become a a, a, a competent musician and a good musician, mm-hmm. great musician, and then and the and the constellation of people together I don't think is the issue. Well, no, I, but with the Beatles it, it really is because I mean I I know plenty of rock bands that have four really good musicians and and sound terrible. Mm. Right. It, the, the 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 goal here is how it all fits together and how they sounded as a band. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you can get. Right, you could you, if they flew in another drummer, right? Ringo quits and they they put in I don't know whoever. Um, it's not the same. It's not the Beatles anymore. It's it's a, it's right. a completely different you know it's a completely different uh, you know chemistry. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know I mean we we can't I mean it's not a scientific <laughs> formula. It, it's it's somewhat folly to try and you know <laughs> to try and make it a formula at this point. But you know the, the what what he is saying in you know, in both the main film and in the bonus footage is for them to be that good. They had to play together. They they had to pay their dues. It was, it was, it was very much in a collective. And he goes so far as to say that. He said, you weren't a John fan or a Paul fan or a Ringo fan at first. You were a Beatle fan. Hmm. You know, and he, he, he emphasized the, you know, the collective. I think that's actually the word he used was the collective yep. as opposed to the individual. Mm-hmm. That's That's very possible. You know, I, it's two uh, two sides of the coin. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, now, rather than have each of us, because we, we do want to move on to the uh, the special features, and and as usual, we've been gabbing so much that we're starting to get get into trouble time wise, <laughs> as always. Yeah. So. In going into the the, the, the special features, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of pass each one over to uh, to one of you and see what uh, uh, what you have to say, and then uh, and then we can um, discuss it. Uh, the words and music section, which is uh, to me, I think, is probably the best uh, of all of the. Uh, the, uh, as all of the special features. I'll tell you what, Ken. Let me uh, let me get your summation of that. Uh, let me see. I wrote a whole bunch of notes down here. Uh, in general, I loved all the special features. There was something that I learned, maybe something new, or maybe something I hadn't heard before, especially from Ringo, who really shines a lot. And even Steve brought this up in last yes. week's show. Because, you know, between Paul and Ringo, I think almost everything Paul has said I've heard before. Right. And Ringo is just so animated, you know, and you can see, you can tell in his voice he enjoys talking about this uh, for this particular uh, project. But certain things that they brought up in the very beginning with words and music, the fact that, uh, well, Ringo said that when the whole debate was whether or not they would go with How Do You Do It to record that, which George Martin wanted them to do. And Ringo said, we, we stood up for ourselves and we wanted to do the Lennon McCartney stuff. Just never heard Ringo talk about it, you know? Mm-hmm. It's That's a, true. There's so many things that I guess Ringo has never got into detail on so many aspects of the Beatle years. Just to hear him say that, Paul talking about, and I think it's something that should be brought up more often, you know, their love for music that's pre-rock and roll. You know, how much he loved Fred Astaire and Huggy mm-hmm. Carmichael. Uh, not just because he liked the artist, but he actually mentioned the chords of the songs structurally and lyrically. He found them interesting. And so did John, as much as he's known for being a rock. He loved that stuff, too. He went into talking about For Me To You, which I... I've never understood why he points to that song so much as being, you know, something pivotal, (laughs) you know, the Beatles recordings. But, you know, he talked about going to a G minor, you know, which it was it was an odd. What's the word chord progression to to use at that at that moment? And I love Peter Asher's comments about the whole thing. 
In fact, they did feature uh, part of the demo for A World Without Love in there. Yes. And they showed uh, footage of, of Peter and Gord doing the song on, on the show Crackjack, which I'd never seen before. Mm-hmm. But, but um, not, without, not without stepping all over the demo. All 30 seconds that we get of it. <laughs> yep. They had to step all over it. <laughs> um, I loved how Ringo and Paul were talking about George and how he was more serious. Than the others, um, Ringo said his guitar solos were so emotional and part of the song. You know, you've always in recent years you've seen Paul and Ringo talk about how they, the two of them, complimented each other. Yeah. I loved hearing Paul talk about John being an incredible rhythm guitarist, which he doesn't get enough credit for. Paul talking about James Jamerson as being an influence, and just the fact that his bass lines were very melodic, and also talking how they were not just a rock band. And Peter Asher uh, bringing up how innovative they were, especially with the bass playing and the drumming. And um, one thing I didn't understand was Elvis Costello's comment about paperback writer. He said that's when they became a rock and roll band. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know what that. I don't know. You know, there's a lot of great rockers before. <laughs> yeah, uh, ticket to rock. Uh, but um, yeah, he, he mentioned that I guess because there was a lot of innovation at that time in the recordings and double tracking, mm-hmm. yeah. especially with the vocals. He brought that up. You know, that's just from that one, the, the part one, the words and music feature. That's what I love most about that. You know, and just hearing all the different comments from various people, but especially when it came to Ringo and Peter Asher throughout all the, the, the specials there. I forget where he said it. Oh, it's an early clues in a new direction. But Peter Asher uh, had said something, which I think he said before. But apart from the fact that they were a great band together, he also said that they're so talented individually and he brought up the fact that he said that uh, if george had been the leader of another band he would have been the star of the band so that's another thing that people don't bring up often enough is that each of the four of them were so strong on their own you know that any of the four of them could have been leaders in whatever bands they were in mm. as a, not just the fact that they were great together so you know that if you're talking about words and music that's what i enjoyed the most I really wish that they had made more use of Peter Asher in the Peter Asher's comments mm-hmm. in the main film. Oh, but sure. I but I can I can understand because uh, again, aiming the film at millennials, they're probably thinking, you know, millennials have no idea who Peter Asher is. Mm. So, you know. And I have to wonder one thing, and that is that if this movie is about their touring and their performances, why are they asking all these people all these other questions about the Beatles? Were they thinking all along these are going to be bonus features? Because you're supposed to be targeting on the touring mm-hmm. and the performing. Yeah. So, you know. Well, yeah. That's exactly it. Ones. That's. I mean, that that exactly was, was my issue with all these bonus materials it seems to me that when you're going to make a dvd built around a feature and the subject of the feature is the touring years you have to ask yourself a question that i'm not sure they really ask themselves which is what would be good stuff to put on a bonus disc about the beatles touring years Mm -hmm. and the logical answer the only logical answer is footage of the beatles performing during the touring years well what, we get 12 minutes of that we get 12 <laughs> minutes of that most of it colorized and all of it excerpts and two right. of it two of it with a soundtrack from some other concert yeah. you know the, of yeah. the five tracks we get two of them have the mismatched audio right uh, two of them are colorized mm-hmm. only one of them and so what it comes so- down to is we get you can't do that from melbourne and that is the entire extent of the bonus features that are what people would have wanted to see on a bonus disc okay um, now i need i need somebody to talk some sense into me about this <laughs> I, can, I can understand okay i can understand in the main film Using well, I can kind of understand them in the main film using the Hollywood Bowl audio for the Manchester with the Manchester no. video. Why? Yeah, I can, why? Well, I mean, I can kind of understand it. I don't understand them using the Hollywood Bowl audio with the Manchester video 
in this section where they're specifically giving you complete performances. Mm -hmm. They should be giving you the original performances from the Manchester concert. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. If the audio is not suitable, go pick another song. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And the audio was suitable. That's the thing. We've all heard it. Exactly. It's perfectly fine. (laughs) And, I mean, if they if they don't like that particular twist and shout, there are other performances of twist and shout. You know, there's the Royal Command performance. There's the Ed Sullivan show. There's uh, Washington uh, Coliseum. There's the Washington Coliseum. There are plenty of uh, plenty of performances they could pick out of twist and shout if they don't particularly like that one from Manchester, which is a fine one anyway. And the same with She Loves You. Yep. You know, it, 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 that makes absolutely no sense to me. Mm. You know, uh, plus the uh, the the colorization of, uh, and there's another example. What they should have done in the case of those complete performances is, if you're going to show the "Can't Buy Me Love" from the new music, the '64 New Musical Express Paul Winters show, show it in black and white. You know, <laughs> instead of that that muddy, blurry colorization, I mean that makes absolutely no sense. Mm-hmm. So so yes, as Alan was saying, the only really worthwhile performance of those five is you can't do that from uh, from Melbourne. Mm. You know. Um, now the uh, new clues. Um, Early clues to a new direction, direction. to a new direction, which is obviously a line from A Hard Day's Night. Who would like to uh, to handle that one? Well, I could I could talk about that. Dave, please. And as I recall, uh, didn't uh, the Miramax Hard Day's Night DVD use the same? uh, Yes, they did. As a matter of fact, yeah. Yeah. So there's one one stolen there. Um, I mean, this is basically just an early Beatles uh, history. Uh, is all it is. It, it really that's really what I mean. It really wasn't worth. Uh, I mean, I, I I've watched that a couple of times and it's kind of like, oh okay, you know. I mean, there's really not much there. I mean, again, we've got all the talking heads, you know, uh, and there is some some new footage with Paul and Ringo, but uh, I mean, basically that's all this is. Is it's just it goes back a little further. Uh, I will reiterate the comments about words and music that it's an excellent uh and and the ringo part is fantastic i mean it's great to hear him talk so authority authoritatively and technically i mean because when he when he talks technical he knows what he's talking about and uh, and he doesn't do that enough but um early clues is is basically just going back to the very beginning is is all it is and apropos of what alan was saying Again, if you're dealing with a uh, a film about the Beatles touring years, this really isn't fish nor fowl, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So, any, anybody have any uh, any further thoughts on that particular section? Well, what a, uh, one one nice little nod, uh, particularly this time of year that I liked in that section was the Elvis Costello interview. Where they showed a little bit of the guys from the Goon shows and talked yes. about how, how you know not only were they fans of it and how you know it connects to the story with George Martin, but how that kind of played into their Christmas records. Right, uh, I thought that I mean, it was it was it was nice, not necessary, but you know, it was certainly better than what Whoopi Goldberg contributed to that section. <laughs> In, that's, in that, fact, that's the section where she said, I'm yeah. actually looking at my notes, the song was I Want to Hold Your Hand, and they played it on the radio, and I thought, I like that. Thanks, I feel like I was there. <laughs> <laughs> so. But with Whoopi, you and, know, in the movie itself, I think her story was a little bit more interesting. Just from the perspective of a black girl going oh, yeah. to a concert yeah, that was fun. primarily a white audience. And why did she connect with the Beatles? You know, why were the Beatles exciting to her? Right, but in this this particular section, you know, she didn't really seem to uh, add very much. And and as a matter of fact, uh, speaking about the you know the goons influence on them and all, instead of having Eddie Izzard in this film, if you're going to talk about you know the Beatles' humor, 
wouldn't it have been perhaps better to have somebody like, oh, I don't know, Eric Idle? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> In the film, to mm-hmm. talk of you know somebody whose whose humor, whose sense of humor is a lot closer to theirs. Sure, yeah. and who and actually knew, knew and who actually knew one of them. Well, yes, and you're right. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, geez, I mean, that's yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, any any of the pythons would do. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. Also, uh, now, one thing yeah. about that feature, mm-hmm. I do like the fact that they brought up women and how important women were in their lives. And in fact, when you put the DVD in and you've got the um, the menu in front of you, and then you've got this clip from John talking about he lived with five women, these five strong women, and it was like the men were invisible in his mm-hmm. life. You know, it's a, it's an important part of his life that many of us don't really know much about or even talk about. Right. But, you know, um, just that and the fact that Liverpool was a very matriarchal town. Mm-hmm. The women knew what was going on. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, I love the fact that they brought that up. Mm. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of the criticisms that I've heard about the film in other, speaking of women, uh, in other, uh, other places uh, is that there's... Um, you know, there's nothing about the fact that uh, that there was that there was sex going on on the tours. <clears throat> you know, uh, it's first of all, you know, we know this. It's it it's silly because this is a let's face it, this is an authorized uh, chronicle of their touring years. Obviously, on you know, in that kind of a film, you're not going to have you know, a lot of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You know, they do, they do touch on the, you know, the pot smoking and all. But, uh, you know, uh, it, it would be silly to expect them to, uh, to, to touch on, uh, you know, the, the alleged Fellini satiricon that was going on on the tours, according to John Lennon. The same man who um, who had him smoking uh, smoking a joint in in the uh, in the bathroom at uh, in Buckingham Palace for the uh, the, M- the the MBE awarding uh, in uh, in October of sixty five, which apparently did not happen. So you know we don't know how <laughs> how satiricon like the mm. tours actually were. So, sure, I'm sure there was, you know, there was a certain amount of sex going on, but, you know, that was, that would be common in, in, on any tour. Any tour, right. It was interesting to see the, the um, Ronnie Spector. Well, in- okay. <laughs> okay. I know you have um, issues with Ronnie Spector. <laughs> no, I don't. Ronnie's- oh, do you? Do you, Al? Yeah, yeah. Uh-oh. Ronnie Uh-oh. says Ronnie says a lot of stuff, and a little bit of it is true. <laughs> but you'll never let facts get in the way. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I'll give you a perfect example in this segment. She talks about how, you know, about how uh, the, the the Beatles called her up from the hotel and uh, and uh, you know said that we're we're prisoners in here. Well, I'll just I'll take you up to Harlem. There's only one little problem. On that first tour, when the Beatles came to America, the Ronettes were in England, <laughs> with stooping with the Rolling Stones. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, they weren't in America. As I said, Ronnie just she just basically just throws everything. You unless, know, every unless that happened, I guess maybe when they came back. That's the only thing I can think of. But yeah. for all we know, it could have happened in '66. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, well, it wouldn't have happened in '66 because Fox, uh, whatever, yeah. right because she wasn't allowed on the tour by uh, by uh, the uh, current resident of the state of California. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Okay, so I don't know, I, I, uh, uh, Steve. I, I stole your thunder on that. No, so no, no. That's all right. That's all right. I, I just no. I just thought that was it, it, you were talking about, you know, the fact that 
you know, all sorts of things happened on the, the Beatles tours, and there's Ronnie Spector not talking about any of that, you know. Right. Well, she did in her book. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the fascinating fan segment. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean... Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I'm sure they're. I'm sure they're very nice people, and what they had to say was mildly interesting while you were watching it, and it made me feel that I'm so glad they didn't give me a Beatles concert when I could be watching this. So, yeah, yeah, that's great. It was a great decision. Give us three fans talking about, you know, seriously, is anyone going to watch that twice? You know, once was was nice, it was entertaining, but again, I don't think it was what you put on a bonus disc, because the whole point of these packages is supposed to be that you're going to want to watch them more than once. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, why would you buy it? You can watch it on Hulu, you know? Right. And that, to me, just seemed like, oh my God, they just don't have any idea what the audience is interested in about the Beatles and about this film, and well, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna count I'm gonna counter you on this one because I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do that too. I actually don't mind the fan footage. My objection, and it's a very strong one, is that the whole purpose of this movie was supposed to be. Um, I mean, they when they when they announced the film. They made the whole thing, uh, you know, as saying they wanted fan footage. They they were going to get fans involved, and they fell way off doing that. Mm-hmm. And in fact, and I'm going to talk spe- specifically. I'm referring to San Francisco, because Ken, you and I saw they were interviewing people that day at Candlestick Park when McCartney was there, and none yeah. of that made it into the film. None of it. And uh, one person who I'm sure is listening to this show had thought all along that her interview was going to be in the movie. And she is credited at least at the end of the film, but her interview did not get used in, in the DVD or in the bonus footage. I, and, yeah, I was surprised that considering that she was, you can, you can say her name. Well, I don't want to, I don't want to, I, 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 I mean, I suppose we could, we know, we both know who we're talking, yeah, we're you talking about. Uh, Nancy. I'll say right. Nancy. 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 Okay. All right. um, uh, since, she's, hello, you know, since she is in the credits, yes, one would have thought that she would have been included in that uh, in that section. Right. The um, uh, actually the only the one little problem I have with that section is actually I would have liked a little bit more on those those three girls women. Uh, I would have liked actually a little bit more background. For instance, Debbie Gendler. Talking about there was the one little you know the little slide with uh, saying that she had uh, that she had received a copy of of the Please Please Me album as a as a present in 1963. Mm-hmm. How about a little bit of context of you know how you know under what circumstances did she receive it? How did she react to it and all? Because again, it just goes bang bang you know. It's from, uh, you know, she gets the album, and next thing, she's in the audience at the Ed Sullivan Show. Mm-hmm. And, and also, the, uh, the girl from the Washington Coliseum uh, show, uh, Donna uh, Constantinople. How did she get a call from Lady, uh, <laughs> Lady Ornsby Gore? <laughs> you know, what, was, what were the circumstances under which she got that call? Why would she have gotten it, and why would she have been invited to not only the concert but to the, you know, the uh, the the gala after after the concert? Which which, by the way, is is one of the is a major whitewashed item in the film because one of the famous Beatles stories from that first visit to America is about all the problems they had at the the embassy ball after the concert which in fact caused John Lennon to walk out on mm-hmm. the uh, uh, you know on the you know the ball itself and that was uh, that was also the occasion when some high society matron took a cuticle scissor out of her purse and snipped off a a lock of Ringo's hair mm-hmm. you know so and there was you know not even not even a mention of that in there you know just that one little uh, interview with John 
with him, you know, having a having a go, as they say, at the uh, with the interviewer. Mm-hmm. So you know, there, there was one thing about the Debbie Mandler interview that I found interesting, which mm-hmm. is that she said that she joined the Beatles fan club, and Brian Epstein actually wrote to her, <laughs> knowing right. that she was a fan, and she wanted uh, Brian wanted her to be there to get Beatle fans mobilized for uh, you know their first appearance on the Ed Sullivan show and wanted right. her to help. You know, just the right. fact that Brian took the time to do that. Yeah. You know, well that's that, what I mean. That I found that, interesting. You know. That's what I mean. I could have you know used if you know if they are gonna have a segment like that, you you know, give a little bit more context as yeah. to the three the three women themselves and, and their experience. But yeah. I do understand Alan's point that it you know that if you you know that uh, so let me ask this: Who, what, one of us before Alan? It may have actually even been you. Um, said, "Oh, you know, with Whoopi Goldberg talking about how she got to go to Shea Stadium. Uh, aside from the fact that she's a better known person, how is that story any more interesting than any one of these three that's in the bonus footage?" Not. I didn't. I, I didn't say it. No, and and it's not more interesting, really. <laughs> Okay. Um, who, but, who was it that thought the Whoopi Goldberg story was a good one? I'm just. I thought it was. Yeah. I thought it was half no. decent. I didn't. I didn't mean to sound like it was uh, fantastic. Well, this, was so, fantastic. so who's going to watch the uh, the the fan section again? Well, and, frankly, and, you know, I think I think Alan, I'm you know what what I thought was best about the the bonus footage in its entirety was that it was almost like a mirror image of the of the main film. Mm-hmm. There's talking heads, some good, some not good. There's some fan you know, input, some good, some not good. There's live footage, some good, not good. I actually, what I, I won't go and look at it at the bonus contents uh, in a fragmented way and say, you know what, I haven't seen that footage about those three original you know, teenage girls from 64. Let me pop that in. I found um, that I enjoyed the disc. Just by one little trick, and it was called play all. Right. If play yeah. Exactly. Right through, yep. It's almost like watching a different cut of the film, and you know, it it in in some parallel plane corresponds to the you know the Whoopi Goldberg story. Let's say in the main footage of oh my mother got me tickets and didn't tell me where we were going, and then we got to Shea Stadium and. And how how distant a cousin is the story that any one of those other three girls told? Is not terribly far off. Mm-hmm. Just that you know, it's a far far less recognizable face uh, in most right. cases. Um, so I, I, you know, there's no one real part of of the the content list where I said this is a section I'm going to go back to multiple times. Whether it was the words and music, or the bass lead rhythm drum, or you know, the Liverpool segment, or or frankly, this, this segment on the three fans. But as a part of the puzzle, if you play it through, and, you know, the two discs, strangely, both run about the same length of time, about a Yes, hundred. exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. You know, it's, it's kind of like a, a little alternate version of, of the film. And, you know, it's, it's not like it takes, you know, 40 minutes of it either. It, it goes pretty quickly. And, you know, there's enough human interest, you know, uh, angle, I think, that keeps it, you know, keeps it, you know, to a manageable length. Okay. So what I would have done in that case <laughs> and, and, <laughs> is okay, go edit that stuff or as much of it as you could back into the main feature, making the main feature essentially, let's say, a director's cut. Um, yeah. Maybe break it into two or three episodes so that, you know, yeah. you're not sitting there for six hours watching the thing but broken down. And then have disc two be performances by the Beatles. Oh, look, the, I, I, you know the one, the one, the sleeping giant here, which I guess will be coming up soon. In yes, time, next. You know, on the list is the, you know, the the what what should have been the meat and mm-hmm. potatoes of this thing, the live segment. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if we're talking about re-slicing and dicing, you know, the theatrical version. Well, I mean, we mm-hmm. could be here all night and doing director's cuts and things like that. But I mean, no, no one would argue that, uh, however long that that thing on the three fans is, if it's ten minutes long. I don't think anybody would argue that they wouldn't rather see, you know, three uncut performances from uh, from any one of the venues. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, except so. apparently the directors and the people who put together the DVD, seemingly. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Which then brings us to <laughs> recollections of Shea Stadium. 
And, of course, everybody, when they saw that that was going to be a uh, part, of the, uh, part of the special features, thought, oh, okay, here, they'll at least have some complete songs from Shea Stadium, maybe not the entire 30-minute cut that was in the theaters, but at least something. And, of course, there was virtually nothing. Zip. Yeah. <laughs> And and actually, uh, considering the uh, compositing and and all that was done with some of the the songs from the Shea Stadium concert, maybe that's a good thing that that wasn't put on on this disc as a you know as a document mm-hmm. because obviously because obviously it's no no more legitimate a document of what they were you know, how they sounded musically at Shea Stadium than those two Manchester tracks with the Hollywood Bowl soundtrack are. Agreed. Mm-hmm. Well, what, what you know, that uh, the section on the, the Shea recollections ultimately amounts to, undoubtedly to Mr. Cozen's chagrin, is a fourth fan story. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. The fan, uh, you know, having, having a decent bloodline, albeit uh, Tony Bennett's son and, I guess, now manager, Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so Sid, you know, you, you got in through the auspices of Sid. Um, he, he actually is, by the way, now in charge of Universal Records, you know, or, or Verve, the, the jazz side of Universal right. Records. Really? Um, mm-hmm. Wow. Didn't know that. So, you know, okay, yeah, you kids wait here. And then the cops came and said, you kids get out of here. Again, you know, let's move it along. And only because it evolves around Shea Stadium. If this was memories of, I don't know, the Hollywood Bowl or Candlestick Park, it would be just as disposable. But I think just the fact that it was Shea and you're seeing little clips of the Shea, you know, uh, movie in there, it it was a bit of a poke in the eye. It really was. Mm Mm-hmm. Very much so. Yeah. Uh, we we are as usual way over time, so I'll just throw this out. Anybody have any further comments on any of the special features? I actually have one question that I'd like to pose to all of you. It's a factual sure. question. Uh, sure. One of the nice things that I do like are some of these other people who are not in the film or very little in the film. You do get to see Frida Kelly in there, Alan yes. Williams, Beryl Williams, yeah, uh, Bill uh, Beryl, Beryl Beryl Marsden, yeah. yeah. Barry Chan. Larry Kane is in there. Um, Mm -hmm. But there's also Joe Flannery, and um, he became their booking manager. He tells a story how he went to the cavern with Brian Epstein to check out the Beatles for the first time. And I always thought it was Brian with Alistair Taylor. That's what I thought. Actually, the way Joe Flannery puts it is is a a totally new bit of info for, for me, which is that it sounds like Brian asked him to go on his own before Brian went and report back to Brian about what it was like. It, it doesn't. Okay. It doesn't sound like he's talking about going with Brian. I think he. I think he was the advance man there. All right. I must have misinterpreted what he was saying. All right. Good. Although that could be that could be as reliable as, right. the, as the comments by David Picker, who was the the former CEO <laughs> of United Artists, who talked about apparently approaching the Beatles when they were still playing at the Cavern, or approaching <laughs> Brian Epstein when when the Beatles were still playing the Cavern about a movie. Uh-huh. You know that just that totally flies in the face of of the actual history. Yeah, the timeline there is, you know, I mean, yeah. it makes it sound like, so we found this group of nobodies and said, how'd you like to make a movie? Uh, it wasn't quite that. I mean, right. his, his timeline may be, uh, may be off. But <laughs> What grade would you guys give the book that comes in the deluxe? Uh, I'd give it a B minus. It's, yeah, it's okay. Uh, there's, uh, I'd give it a B. Uh, for for any uh, anybody who hasn't seen it, there's a um, uh, a small essay by Ron Howard, and a uh, b- more of a chronology type of piece by John Savage, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, and uh, a good goodly number of photos, most of which are actually included in the film, if I if I recall correctly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's 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 nice for yeah, you know, gets it done. for what it is. Yeah, it gets it done. Yeah, right. It's only in, I, I believe it's only in the deluxe version, um, and not in the the regular version. So it's the same size booklet that you would get in the Beatles one plus. Right. Yeah. 
I'll well, give it a B. It gives it's you something nice. to do while you're sitting through the boring extra features. You can at least read a book. <laughs> 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 tough crowd. You've got a tough crowd. Tough crowd. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tough crowd. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we are. Tough that's crowd, a, boy. I'm not that tough on this film. so. Yeah. No, that's true. That's true. You're, you're the the the, uh, the the voice of reason as always. <laughs> Everything is wonderful, right? <laughs> and such little portions. Yes, <laughs> such little, teeny, just a taste. They say, mm-hmm. yeah. just a little taste. You know, it was kind of interesting uh, in the you know the last little, I guess, little sweet, uh, the deeper dive, which had the Liverpool thing and the the Ronnie mm-hmm. Spector and the uh, Hardy. Mm-hmm. Right bit. There's that little mini documentary of the trip to Australia. Oh yes. And I knew I what I saw was right, but I said, let me just rewind that to make sure before I go saying it. Uh, we actually get a few glimpses of Jimmy Nickel. No, mm-hmm. no mention of him. No, no mm-hmm. nothing. I mean, as mm-hmm. close as you get to a mention is when they're showing that stage clip where Paul says. And we're glad to have, you know, back on the drums, Ringo Starr. Um, but uh, Jimmy Jimmy does uh, creep into there a little bit, which is uh, worth pointing out. Mm-hmm. And and Pete Best also creeps in ever, ever so slightly. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And that's, uh, that's about all she wrote on the bonus footage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Anybody else have any comments before we wrap things up? No. Yeah. I'm oh, trying I to find this one. I think we've pretty well. I think we've yeah, pretty much exhausted it. the subject. Oh. Yeah. No, I, I was just going to say there was Please. one quote from Ringo that I found. You know, it's a simple statement, but I thought it was powerful. Um, he said, "I was great at diffusing all their problems about the Beatles." Mm-hmm. Mm. So just to give himself credit like that, you know, you know, he's the fact that he's stepping forward, you know, yeah. and saying these things, you know, I just. I found that to be really powerful. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I thought, as, as Steve had mentioned last week, uh, I thought that, uh, that Ringo actually really, uh, really shines in the, in the bonus features because, you know, you get to, you get to hear comments from him that you just normally, uh, don't hear. I mean, he, mm-hmm. he doesn't do many interviews and generally when he, whenever he, whenever he does interviews, they're five minutes mm-hmm. and it's generally the, the same, the same questions either about the all-star band or, or mm-hmm. the typical, the more typical Beatles, uh, Beatles questions. So hearing him talk, uh, with, in this kind of depth, uh, was, is, uh, was actually a very nice treat. Yeah. I think it was Steve who pointed out before when he was talking about, if not technical aspects of drumming, at least drumming styles. Um, and the thing that we all know makes him a great drummer. Um, and for him not, not to have to reclaim it, but, for the millennials or for the people who are less uh, familiar with the story. You know, look, he's no John <laughs> Moon, and that's probably a good thing. You know, uh, you wouldn't want him, st- what we call stepping on the vocal or stepping on the song. The drummer, he he it has a very particular flavor of drumming, and that's what we can, it's just not a technical term, it's just called he's a good song drummer. He's a mm-hmm. song. Again, I'm pretty sure if uh, I had Lennon, McCartney, and Harrison singing out in front of me, I wouldn't want to be stepping on the vocal either. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so he gets a lot of credit there. Um, and even in that segment that's called, um, was it lead, bass, rhythm, and drums or something like that? Mm-hmm. I think they picked a good track to play underneath that and kind of link it all together, which was Rain. Because you hear some really good leads, some really good rhythms, some really good drums. Um, Paul and Ringo are completely locked in there completely mm-hmm. um you really hear how good i mean he he can get busy and still not step on the song exactly mm-hmm. good point exactly and and as you say a a keith moon or a john bottom just simply would not have been the right fit for those yeah for, for that, uh, that unless particular of course, band unless of course they practice for ten thousand hours then maybe <laughs> <you're>... <laughs> right. mm-hmm. Very true. Now, the Beatles were an excellent example of a band that complemented each other. Yeah. Yep. They didn't step over each other. Everything that they played was what was necessary in the song yeah. without right. drawing attention to another musician. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Very true. That's one of the reasons why a lot of people say that the uh, the sum of the sum of the whole doesn't equal the whole. Mm. Yeah, the the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. That's right. right. You bet. Exactly. Yep. But that's another discussion. No mm-hmm. discussion. For and, bef- and before this, because and before this turns into a two-hour spectacular, mm-hmm. uh, we uh, we better wrap things up. We were going to do some mail, and I think we'll uh, I think we'll we'll postpone that for next week. Okay, Steve. That's fine. Fine. Okay. I'll. So why don't we uh, quickly do uh, do our contact, Steve? How do you how do we uh, how do people get in t- contact with us? We have a, tw- a Twitter uh, uh, account uh, at sign things we said fab. We have a, uh, a Beetle our uh, things we said today Beetle uh, fan page on Facebook, and and you can get a hold of me uh, at beetlesexaminer at gmail dot com. And we have things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. There we go. Email. Thank you, sir. And the and the download. Pitch for the show is on podbean.com, where you can download all the shows. Okay. And Alan? Um, probably the easiest way to get in touch with me is on Facebook, either under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Mm-hmm. And me uh, as well on Facebook, Al Sussman, Twitter, at ASUSS49, or www.beetlefan.com. Uh, Ken? Uh, my email address is every little thing at att.net. You can also reach me on my Facebook page under Ken Michaels. And then there's my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. Make sure you always check out my Beatles trivia and games page to win one of nine prizes every single week. And there's very often a special contest. I'm hoping, hoping to give away uh, a copy of um, the Blu ray for mm. eight days a week soon. Ooh. Could be this week. Can't promise you that, though. Nice. Okay. And uh, and Tom is showing himself to have increasing wisdom in staying away <laughs> from from the the, the <laughs> sewer that social media has become. Uh, hey, Tom. Look, I, I say this about the four of you because you are my friends, not despite the fact that you're my friends. <laughs> My friends in general, Al, you know, they're a high man. Yes. They're hard enough to keep up with in real life. Uh, I think if I had to survive the, uh, particularly the events of the first week of November uh, on the political front, if I had to survive that uh, in a social media landscape, I probably would have jumped off a bridge somewhere. And, uh, believe, and believe me, it has <laughs> continued well past the first week in November. I'm, I'm aware. Oh, uh, so, continuing so, uh, now. So yeah, yes. really, yeah. So when people say, "How can we get a holy?" I just swing by the house. You know, <laughs> that's mm-hmm. yeah. uh, no, actually, uh, to reach to reach me on uh, all matters Beetle, go to the brunchradio dot com, which is Joe Johnson's Beetle Brunch, and we have a contact us page. With it's got its own little you know box there where you can uh, send in questions or comments, and we'll be sure to uh, to take care of whatever it is you need. Right, and and also with uh, through uh, Beetle Fan Magazine. Oh yeah, you know you can run them through. Either I, I do get the oddball, uh, you know, email here or there um, from Beetle Fan, which is uh, uh, is it uh, www.beetlefan.com. Dot com or at thefest.com. People, yes, Mark Mark will send me something saying, "Hey, you know, somebody knows." Somebody has a trivia question for you. You know, did I do the trivia contest over at the fest or? or Maybe it's not a trivia question. It's just a question that they think I would know because I know the trivia. So either through thefest.com or www.beetlefan.com or brunchradio.com. Um, you can find me at any of those places. Absolutely. Okay, that's great. Well, this has been a uh, fascinating, uh, very interesting uh, conversation. Ooh. And uh, yeah, I think overall we would still we would say that even with all the criticism that we've that we've made about the uh, about the DVD and Blu-ray package, if you're going to get it on Blu-ray uh, or DVD, go for the you know go for the two-disc package because oh, there yeah. there is enough Absolutely. interesting there is enough interesting material on that sure. second disc to make sure. it worthwhile. Mm-hmm. 
All right. So, Tom, thanks very much for uh, on very short notice for uh, for joining us. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you for uh, thanks for the uh, invite. It's always and I'm a pleasure. sure we'll uh, I'm sure we'll be uh, lassoing you in here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Again, we'll see, any, we'll see what time? maybe maybe when you guys do the thing on the uh, Yoko reissues, you can deal me in. Okay. Okay. That's, uh, mm-hmm. that's uh, probably a very uh, very good idea. Okay. Well, you can deal me in on that. Okay. All, All right. right. Tom, again, thanks very much. I, I, and... I'm waving like they can see. <laughs> <laughs> And for Tom Frangione and Alan Cozen and Steve Marinucci and Ken Michaels, this is uh, Al Sussman. And we thank you very much for uh, listening to Things We Said Today, and we will see you next time. And happy Thanksgiving.